Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Avidas Safarian, who is the president and CEO of RAP, which is Worldwide Responsible Accredited Production. So please welcome him to the stage. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I got them quiet. That's right. That's so quiet. Okay. So welcome. Thank you. I know you have a presentation, um, and I think uh, the beginning is is sort of to give us an overview of rap. Sure. Let me start with that. Let me. Great. Okay. Let me stand up for this one so I can get out of the way and not. Uh, Actually, I'm going to stand too, so I don't get in the way of the PowerPoint. Okay. Great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I believe we are at the Sustainable Fashion Forum. I based that little factoid, uh, given the information on every one of these uh, panels and posters and stuff. Uh, and I'm really grateful for that first word in that, uh, in that topic, Sustainable Fashion Forum, because if this were just the Fashion Forum, I would have no business being here. Um, most of you all would be fine. I'm looking around the room and this is a very fashion forward room, but I would not. In fact, as I stand up here and look out, I realize uh, with maybe one other exception, there's nobody else in the room wearing a tie. I think ties are going out of fashion and nobody told me that. But I'm a lawyer, I come from a suburb of DC, this is what we look like, so. Is Can't help that. Is it a recycle tie? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm really, I'm really grateful for that word, sustainable. It's a very important word. Uh, and we've heard from <clears throat> some great speakers uh, throughout the course of the day just how important it is. <clears throat> but it's important to me in a slightly different way. Um, and that's what I'll be spending the next few minutes, in fact, this whole session talking about. This is going to be a, a different session from all the ones we've covered so far. And the reason for that is um, most folks, when they think, when they hear the word sustainable, uh, the natural inclination and, and most of the focus of the preceding panels has been to focus on the environment, uh, which is of course very important. There's no question about it. Sustainability does at its core require that we do whatever it is we're doing in a way that is responsible environmentally is, uh, and, and conscious of our impact on our planet. But there is more to sustainability than simply the environmental impact of our uh, you know, production and manufacturing and sourcing and selling practices. There's also the labor component to it, the social element of it. Um, sustainability has many definitions, uh, but my favorite has always been the one that draws from the 1980s UN committee that studied this, that basically says sustainability is doing whatever it is that you're doing in a manner that does not endanger the ability of future generations to likewise do the same. That's what sustainability boils down to. Whatever it is you're doing, you have to do it in a way that does not endanger your kid's ability to also do that same thing. And so while that very much means that you must make your jeans or your tote bags or whatever it is you're making in a way that does not draw from the earth resources that your children cannot continue to draw upon, it also means making sure that you do them in a way that the workers in the factories that are making them can sustainably continue to do so and, and the next generation of owners can keep those practices going. So a factory that is using fossil fuels, you know, non-renewable resources uh, is not sustainable, but so too is a factory that is beating up those workers. So too is the fact that it's not paying those workers a proper wage. So too is the fact that it's making those workers work in unsafe conditions. Those are all unsustainable manufacturing practices. And so for me, sustainability has a strong labor social component to it too, in addition to the environmental component. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about. Uh, because that's the space that RAP occupies. The other way w this panel is different from all the others is you've heard a lot about various different certifications out there. Uh, you've heard of labels that, that, that people rely upon to certify their uh, production resources, whether it's uh, the Forest, Forestry Stewardship Council or uh, other kind of stuff, Bon Sucro. All those things are important and very much related to sustainability, but they focus on physical product. They focus on you know, wood or sugarcane or the, the textile itself. You're going to be hearing from me about RAP a standard pr that is a social compliance standard. So we will not be 
looking to a factory to study the physical material that goes into the stuff coming out of that factory, we will instead be looking at the working conditions in that factory, how the workers are being treated, and certifying that. So that's what uh, Nancy asked me to start off with, just a few minutes to introduce you to RAP. Uh, we're talking about social compliance certification in general. I'm not really here to pitch my organization. Um, but then, you know, what kind of CEO would I be if I wasted a captive audience? and didn't tell you a little bit about RAP. Plus, it's kind of important to get the context for what we're going to discuss because it's a little bit different from everything else that has preceded uh, this session. So, really quickly then, uh, let me introduce to you RAP, Worldwide Responsible Accredited Production. We are the world's largest factory-based social compliance certification program. Uh, that's independent, you know, our own entity. You heard Prana, for example, talking about them doing their own internal audits. We are not a brand. We don't buy product. We only validate working conditions in factories. We have no stake in the business of those factories. So that makes us an independent validation program. And in that sense, uh, I think a little bit more credible than a brand inspecting its own supply chain. So we are the world's largest independent factory-based program for this industry. We focus on some products, apparel, footwear, you know, ties, which only two of us are bothered by in this room, um, and, and, and the like. Uh, so uh, we are industry uh, specialists, as opposed to other social compliance programs out there that don't specialize. We believe in, in going deep and, and having that kind of expertise for this industry. We are limited uh, in scope as far as industry goes, but not so when it comes to geography. We inspect and certify factories all over the world. The W stands for worldwide. The way we describe ourselves is as an objective nonprofit team of global social compliance experts. That's who we are. What we do is promote safe, lawful, humane, and ethical manufacturing practices throughout the world. That's kind of our mission. And how we do it is through that certification program that I'll talk to you a little bit more in detail in a second. Um, and in general, education. We believe in spreading the gospel of compliance, such as it were. And so I go around the world attending events like this, talking about why it matters, and trying to get folks to understand that in the sustainability conversation, it is important not to lose sight of the workers, of the human, the social element, uh, which is not to suggest that we are you know, denigrating the importance of the environmental side. That is obviously very much important, but it's Tied together is the point. You can't have just the environmental uh, consideration without the social element to it. Um, and we believe in doing so by working with industry. Uh, there are a lot of campaigns out there uh, on the environmental side as well as the social side that have a industry is evil sort of uh, message. Uh, and they believe in naming and shaming and the old, old school Greenpeace pie in the face type of stuff. Uh, we don't think that that actually is very effective in the long run because we have found that you get a lot more traction and you actually can drive a lot more change working with industry, getting them to understand why this matters to them. You've heard from great brands who are telling you truly the business case for acting in an environmentally responsible fashion. They're doing so uh, not because it is uh, a tax they're imposing on themselves. They're doing so because it's actually good for their business. We believe that. We believe in making that case on the social side as well. And so we tend to partner with industry and over the years have become truly the industry's program of choice. Uh, best perhaps exemplified by the fact that the largest industry association in, this, in the apparel space in America is the AAFA, the American Apparel and Footwear Association, uh, representing over a thousand brands. You're, you're all wearing something that I'm guessing was made by a member brand. Um, and we are their official CSR partner, Corporate Social Responsibility Partner. Our, our code, our standard is based on 12 principles that cover these issues. I won't go into detail. Uh, suffice it to say that these are the core sort of universally accepted conditions for what, we, what, what it would take to ensure uh, socially responsible manufacturing happening in the factories. Things like no forced labor, no child labor, no harassment and abuse, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we are worldwide, as I said. Um, again, won't go into much detail here, but we have personnel in all of these places. Headquartered in the DC area, as I already uh, mentioned. Uh, we have 28 staff all around the world, most in fact out in Asia, only about 11 of us are in the US. And then we partner with monitoring from all over the planet to ensure that the audits we do are conducted by local auditors uh, who are familiar with the culture, know the language, know the laws, and won't be you know, prohibitively expensive for a factory to utilize uh, because we're not flying them to China from 
here or to Bangladesh from you know, somewhere in Europe. We use local partners for all of that. Um, I said we are the world's largest program. I wanted to just back that up with some numbers. I won't go into detail here. These are our top 10 countries from last year. Um, 3,197 factories applied for our certification uh, in 2018. Uh, as of the beginning of this quarter, we're the third day of the quarter here, we have a little over 2,700 factories with a current RAP certificate, altogether employing over 2.5 million workers in 42 different countries. So quite a big footprint, if I say so myself, but then I'm biased. Um, we can talk a little bit in the questions, Nancy, about the process of an audit. Uh, I don't know if that interests anybody, but it really is, it, as the word suggests, uh, just like a financial audit, it is a sample review of the conditions in that factory. We have to physically inspect the factory, uh, go through an on-site review, look at documents, look at uh, procedures and policies, talk to workers, talk to management, um, and then a report is generated that comes to RAP for validation. If it meets our principles, we certify the factory. All factories are subject to surprise checks um, at any time during the certification program. And even that initial audit is uh, on a date unknown to the factory. There'll be a window period for the audit, and any time during that window, uh, the auditors will show up. So the factory doesn't know when we're coming. If you want more details, I'll, I'll share it then. What it comes down to really is making sure that during these visits, uh, that, that you are, the auditor that is, satisfying yourself that the factory has adequate management systems in place to give you the comfort you need that the conditions you're seeing in the factory, which are okay at the moment, will continue to stay okay after you've left. That's the real key here, right? This is not simply a spot check. I show up, I look at where all the exits are, I look at where the fire extinguishers are. Where are the fire extinguishers here? Um, <laughs> let's not worry about that. Uh, and then leave. No, you need to make sure that you're checking all that and checking to make sure that the folks who are staying behind after you leave know where the exits are. Know what periodicity those fire extinguishers need to be replenished by. Know what training has to be given to new employees. That's what we're really looking for. And for that, uh, you need to have top management committed to the process. You need to have a sense that there's been total adoption, deployment, and ongoing monitoring. You're not simply going to say, oh yeah, these are the principles that we abide by. You know, I say that to you when you show up to check me, but I'm not actually doing that after you leave. I want to make sure that there is deployment, and I want to make sure that there is some internal monitoring. Are you checking yourselves on a regular basis to make sure that the systems are in place and continuing to be regularly updated as needed? It comes down to ensuring continuous education. And it's across the organization, not just the top guys, but all the employees, right? Because if the rubber hits the road, you know, in the, in the, that's where the problem is, sense of the word, that's where you want to be looking to see that, you know, the rubber is the right quality and the road's properly paved. So it comes down to making sure that those line workers are being properly educated and continuously trained in the things that they need to do. So um, that's all I'll do for introductions, Nancy. I'll just end with a quote that I love. I didn't make this up. A 2010 UNIDO study, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, uh, called Making Private Standards Work For You, cited RAP as the standard most often cited for social compliance certification in the textile sector. Like I said, I didn't make that up but you better believe I always use it when I can. <laughs> the way we describe ourselves in a nutshell is this, a responsive and effective partner for supply chain social compliance monitoring. And that word partner is what it really it comes down to. As you've heard many speakers already say, this is not something, and this being anything related to sustainability, is not something you can tackle on your own. Because you're, no matter how big, no matter how powerful, you're only one piece in a much larger supply chain. So you have to work together. You have to understand that your actions have consequences on others and others' actions have consequences on you. So that partnership approach, that working together has to be central to it and that's how we see ourselves as players in the supply chain. So that's wrap for you. Um, happy to answer any additional questions you might have about the organization afterwards um, and, and give you whatever details you want. But for the moment, let's get back to our conversation and talk about standards and we can sit, and we can sit down. Okay. So one thing that's very unique about RAP is that you go into individual units. It's really an on-the-ground perspective. That's right. How did this all evolve? Can you trace the beginnings? Sure. Uh, and it's, it's one of those things that, you know, people say looking for silver linings out of bad, bad things. 
uh, most social compliance programs uh, inside a brand or, or the few major independent players out there uh, kind of came out and came into existence because bad things happened. And in particular, the, the watershed moment that some of you are probably too young to remember was in the 90s when the whole Kathy Lee Gifford incident uh, took place. Some of you are nodding. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, Kathy Lee is still around. You know, she's still got some TV show or the other. Actually, I think she retired from that TV show. Uh, but did she? Yeah, yeah, well, she did. <laughs> I wish her well. Uh, but back in the 90s, she was at the height of her popularity. Right. She had the uh, Kathy and Regis uh, and, and, and she was a morning talk show celebrity type who uh, licensed her name and likeness for a line of jeans aimed at the, the teeny bopper market, you know, girls between 13 and 19. Um, and it was and sold in mass market retail, Walmart and Kmart. Uh, and it was very, very popular in 1993 or 94, I forget which one it was. That line was the number one line in that category. Um, but unlike, for example, uh, DL 1961, um, she was not vertical in any way. She was just a celebrity licensing her name and likeness. Uh, she didn't make the stuff. She didn't even really have much uh, uh, work in, in, in on the selling side. Um, all that stuff was being made through f an agent that was outsourcing the production to factories that you know, no one had bothered to take a look in until a New York-based um, activist NGO, human rights company, organization did a hidden camera, literally a camera in the baseball hat going into the factory pretending to be buyers um, and long story short revealing to the world that it was truly a sweatshop. This was a factory in uh, uh, Honduras um, employing 12 year old girls working 12 hour shifts under really hot and humid conditions and not even getting paid the proper minimum wage. So that story went on 60 minutes um, and boy that it cause um, a ruckus, and uh, so Kathy Lee Jeans went from being the number one seller in 94 to zero in 95. The brand was decimated, destroyed. Um, and that was a big wake-up call for a lot of the folks who were using effectively the same sourcing model. They were making their stuff in factories they did not own and operate, and so did not have much visibility into what was happening uh, at those factories. And so they said, wait a minute, how can we make sure that that doesn't happen to us. And the, several other things were happening at the same time. The Clinton uh, administration put together an apparel initiative to study this. The in industry put together a, a, t a task force to study it as well. And a couple of our peer organizations emerged from that space and ourselves included. We were the result of the uh, recommendation to the industry to set up an independent nonprofit entity to promulgate a standard, vet these factories, and certify the ones that are meeting the standard. And RAP was born. Um, and I was actually gratified to hear some folks had heard of rap already. There was a, a lady in the back who asked a question uh, referencing rap. She was a little too kind to us. Uh, we haven't been around since the 80s. Uh, she felt, that, but, but we, are, we are one of the, uh, if she is, thank you ma'am, I appreciate that. Um, uh, and and it, I'm glad people feel that way because it, it doesn't mean that we have uh, uh, established ourselves and we are uh, the second oldest of the independent programs out there. Every other, everybody else came out after us. But we were in the late 90s that, that we came out, not in, not in the 80s. So, so let's, let's dig into the certifications. Can you talk about the different levels of certifications that are available? Sure. Uh, for starters, let me, let me talk about the uh, broader sort of approaches that are out there. Not everybody certifies. Right, so there's a lot of programs out there, and, and brands especially, when they do their own internal audits, they don't certify these factories. They're simply checking on them and, and getting a report back. Uh, and that might be good enough for a brand for, for, for their own internal purposes, although I submit again that there is a credibility question to be asked. If you are the ones wanting to place orders in these factories, then yes, one can understand that you would not want them to be bad, but you do have a vested interest in passing them, because you want to place orders there. So there is that question. Um, and, but there are other programs that are independent programs that also don't certify. And again, my, my concern with that approach is not that, there's a, not, not that certificates are a magic silver bullet or anything like that, uh, but they do require that a certain minimum standard be achieved before you can be called you know, kosher to do business with. Uh, so I always liken, and again, this is something that folks uh, 
sometimes get frustrated about because certification, they, they put too much of a burden, too much of an expectation that certification will solve the problem. It will not, Nancy. It'll, it'll not, and I always analogize to driver's licenses, <laughs> right? All of you, I'm guessing, have a driver's license. Uh, um, does that guarantee that not a single person is ever gonna get into an accident? Uh, no. All a driver's license does is it tells you that an independent validation has taken place to assure the world at large that the holder of this piece of plastic knows the basics of operating a motor vehicle. It's a minimum standard, right? It does not qualify you to drive for NASCAR, right, just by itself. It okay, it doesn't. Some people think it does, especially in LA. <laughs> on the freeway. On the freeway, but it does not. What I'm saying is a certification is really effectively simply a validation of meeting a minimum standard. And that's important. That's important because you want to make sure that at the very least you have that basic level covered. But it doesn't solve the problem. Certification itself will not get you there. Uh, my, there's a little uh, uh, aphorism that I uh, heard a few years ago that I also always utilize, right? You do not fatten a pig by weighing it. Let that sink in. You do not fatten a pig by weighing it. Weighing the pig does not make it get any fatter. You got to feed that pig if you want it to get fat. But guess what? You also do have to weigh it, right? To know how fat it is and whether it's gotten to optimal fatity, <laughs> fatness, whatever the word is, rotundity. Uh, you have to weigh the pig. Right? But, it's not the, but the weighing isn't what's making it fat. The weighing is only telling you how fat it is, how much more you have to go, how much fatter it has to get. So the weighing is a tool. That's what the certification is. Right? So imagine, again, compare it to the programs that don't certify. They're just eyeballing the pig. Eh, looks fat enough. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's such a good way of, uh, of going about it. So weigh it, but don't expect the weighing to make it fatter. You've got to then do something with that information and then drive progress. But that certification, that weighing, that initial understanding of where you are is extremely important, and that's what we do. We weigh the pig. <laughs> talk, us, talk us about the ways that you weigh yes. the pig. <laughs> so what are the various weights the pig can have? So for RAP in particular, uh, we have three uh, sort of levels of certification. The standard certification, which we call a gold certification, is a one-year certificate. That's what 90% of the factories uh, get or eventually get because many of them don't pass the audit the first time around. As I said, a certification has to be a minimum standard. So if you get audited, you don't meet that standard, you got to fix whatever is lacking, get audited again, and then if you, you might pass. That gold, that one year is the standard because typically factories change all the time. So you really cannot certify a factory and say it's good forever. So we've settled on a one-year cycle as being the normal due diligence cycle, and that's what we, uh, as I said, do most of our certifications on. That's the gold level. There is a platinum level for factories that have been certified three years in a row with no problems found and no gaps between their certificate. In other words, they've established a good track record with us. Every year coming back, showing us the systems are continually operating well, no issues, no gaps, as I said. If you do that for three years in a row, we reward you with a platinum level certificate which is good for two years. Um, and that's about 9% of our factories. Uh, and then on the other end of the scale, there is the silver level, uh, which is only good for six months. And that's for factories that eventually pass, but they have not really given us the warm and fuzzy about systems. You know, they maybe had two or three audits and they look like they finally got everything in place, but uh, we're not sure they're gonna stay in place after we've left. So you've passed the finish line, we'll give you a certificate, but we're gonna come back and look at you in six months instead of one year just to be on the safe side. And then if you've, you pass again, you, get, you graduate to gold, so to speak. But that thankfully is very rare, less than 1% of our factories are at the silver level. So those are the levels of certification. So how does a brand work with you? Do, do you think that they w need to be certified or do they, yeah. have, how do, what are the steps involved in that That's a great process? question and an important one because uh, folks often misunderstand our model, right? Our clients, the folks that actually pay our bills, are not the brands. The brands don't come to us telling us to certify factories. And we do not certify brands. And I'll tell you in a minute why that is important. Uh, the model works because the individual factory, the particular facility that wants to validate its practices, 
is the one that has to come to us and seek to be audited. Just like you, if you are a corporation filing your uh, uh, 10K or your you know, SEC filings, have to get your financials audited by an independent audit firm to be able to prove that they are indeed uh, you know, materially correct. Uh, the factories have to come to us to be inspected by us to then get that certificate, which they can show the brand. So the brand is, in a very real sense, the ultimate consumer of our product, but the client themselves, the factories, are the ones that come to us and get uh, the process going. Um, and it's important that this be so because you, as I said, when the rubber hits the road, that's where you got to worry about, right? There is no real point. There might be some value, but no real point in certifying a brand. Most brands don't make stuff anymore, right? Most brands are simply marketing institutions. Um, and yes, you want to make sure the brands themselves are treating their own employees correctly and all of that and are doing the right thing by their supply chain. But if there's going to be a problem, odds are it's not going to be at a corporate headquarter in uh, uh, you know, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it's going to be at a factory in Asia. So we want to make sure that we focus on where the problem, if it's going to happen, is likely to happen. So our model is that factory-based model, and all we certify is individual production units, not the brand itself. So that's who comes to us and gets inspected, even though, to your point, they get pushed here mm -hmm. by the, con the brands who are the ultimate consumers of our certificate. So one of the slides had the 12 principles by which you look at factories. Do you want to expand on some of the principles or maybe highlight some that really become a little bit more of a challenge in certifying a factory? Okay. <laughs> so the 12 principles, uh, which I can put right back up here because I know how to work a PowerPoint, uh, are um, the first nine are really uh, drawn from the core ILO conventions, the International Labor Organization conventions uh, that have been promulgated since 1919 to cover the, the, the fundamental rights that workers have in, in uh, workplaces. Um, things like, as I said, no forced labor, no child labor, no harassment or abuse, getting paid properly, not working excessive hours. Um, those are the first nine principles. Uh, we also, and, and most of our peers and all uh, brand uh, uh, codes, that's what they cover. We're very similar in that sense. But we actually go a little bit beyond that. Um, recognizing, again, the importance of that sustainability element, we actually have an environmental piece. Principle 10 is, covers the environment, not uh, in the deep sort of dive sense of a, a, you know, a carbon footprint or a water cycle type stuff, but merely in making sure that the impact to the workers at that factory has been looked at. So effluent is the main thing we look at. How, are, how, are, how is this factory uh, dealing with uh, solid, liquid, and gaseous emissions? And then, because all the factories we work with, by definition, basically, are exporting units, I mean, they're coming to us because a brand that, that wants to uh, place orders with them, and they're going to export that to Europe or the US, we have two principles that cover customs compliance and security. Uh, the last one being uh, benchmark to uh, the Customs and Border Protection CTPAT program, the Customs, Terroriz uh, Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism program. Uh, because again, we want to have that extra value added to these factories to validate to their buyers not only that they're treating their workers right, but that when you place an order here, you're not going to run into effectively you know, customs or security challenges when it comes time to actually take possession of the product as the importer of record here in the US. Those are the 12 principles. What's the one that gives us the hardest time? <laughs> Any guesses? Let me, I know you guys are gonna ask me questions later, so I'm gonna ask you questions now. Yes, ma'am. What would you say is the toughest principle? <laughs> Hours of work. Um, in a way, that's correct in terms of the, the, the number of, of challenges we have in China, for example, where the hours of work laws are quite strict and most factories in reality don't abide by those laws. Hours of work is an interesting uh, uh, um, standard because uh, let me ask you another question. Child labor. Uh, no, child labor is not. Uh, someone said number nine, and that's the right answer, and I'll come to that in a second. Uh, but let me ask you a, 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 a sort of an hours of work question. Um, what is the maximum number of hours you're allowed to work in the United States of America? What's the legal maximum? Depends on the company. Depends on the company. <laughs> what's the law? Is there, what's the federal limit on? Huh? Someone said the right answer. Uh, it actually depends on the company. It's also the right answer because there is no limit. We do not have a law that sets a maximum number of working hours 
in the United States. We have laws that require overtime pay kick in after a certain number of hours, typically 40, depending on industry. But with very few exceptions, you know, long haul truckers comes to mind, there is no federally mandated limit on the number of hours you can work. Uh, so yes, that's a challenging uh, one. But the toughest principle from an audit perspective, hours of work, you can discover what they are. You can audit, you can find them out. But number nine, freedom of association and collective bargaining tends to be the toughest one from an audit perspective because uh, it's a difficult and, and thorny question, even here in the US, um, and one that has often, far too often, if not always, uh, got some political ramifications to it as well, and that can be uh, difficult to deal with. Um, there is a sense that um, uh, some folks believe that unions are the answer to labor problems, um, and I would uh, not disagree with the idea that unions can be very useful and, and definitely something that uh, can help uh, uh, with the bargaining balance power, uh, bargaining power imbalance, but I've never bought into the causation side of that. You know, you, you can have good factories without there being unions. And just having unions doesn't automatically ensure good factories. Uh, so that can be the toughest principle. So that's the answer to which one is the one that gives us the hardest time. So what levels of the supply chain do you find yourselves working with? Another excellent question. Um, and this is something that we, we, we need to work on further because right now, most of our factories, 90 plus percent, are first tier. They are cut and sews, they're final assembly plants. Um, we have some second tier starting to come in now. Uh, fabric, dye houses, you know, washing units, uh, but the vast majority remain at that first tier. Um, and the reason for that is understandable because that, it's that, that first tier that the brand has exposure, right? Uh, you can, if, if, if a factory collapses, you can pull from the rubble a label from that brand, boy, is that going to damage that brand, right? It's a little harder to make that connection with um, uh, uh, the, lo the next tier down because you typically don't have the logo on the fabric. Uh, so so uh, we are having to evolve our thinking around that. But now as traceability uh, uh, becomes more feasible, technology improves, uh, brands are realizing that, you know, if there are problems further up the supply chain, that could still have ramifications for them. And so we're starting to see the movement towards the second tier now coming to us to get certified. But the vast majority of the work is still being done at that first tier, final assembly. What would you say are some tangible ways some factories could begin to get certified if they're not fully ready to yet? Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the short answer to that uh, is there is no short answer. <laughs> uh, the shortest <laughs> answer next to that is the, is the challenge with uh, uh, getting a factory ready for compliance, uh, for, for certification, is that quite often to this day, factories see compliance really as a necessary evil rather than an actual positive good. Right. Right? And this is important because from a mentality perspective, if you're thinking of something as a negative, then you naturally want to minimize the pain, right? It's like going to the dentist, right? <laughs> How much time do I really want to spend in that chair? As little as possible, right? Uh, that's a cost mentality. If we can get them to switch to an investment mentality, right? So this is not about going to the dentist. Mm -hmm. It's about going to the gym, right? You're investing in yourself. Then it's different, right? You don't, you know, I mean, some of us do want to minimize time in the gym as well. But we don't generally tend to, tend to think of it that way. We're thinking of it as a positive. So the first step, as I said, there's no short answer. The first step is trying to work on that mentality to get folks who see it as a necessary evil and therefore let's minimize, let's do the basic we can as little as possible to this is an investment for our long-term growth and, and the business case matters and then they become more attuned to it. And let me tell you, as we see this play itself out in practice, um, a factory, show me a factory that is still being run by that first generation owner who set it up and is kind of old school and you know, is, is of a certain mentality and a certain age, and I'll show you some problems, versus a factory that's being run by the kid that this guy then sent to Wharton or 
Oxford or wherever to get an MBA because he made a lot of money in his business and is now coming back to run the factory. And I'll show you somebody with a much different mentality, more inclined to think long term and see investments as opposed to just payroll to payroll, maximize profit and minimize expenses. Okay. So I have one more question before I open it up. Um, I'm sorry, do we have time? One more question? With, with you know changes in the global fashion industry, any trends in compliance that do you think are going to affect you in the years to come, or are you foreseeing? Yeah, well, um, there are specific compliance issues that are more prevalent today than there were before. So, uh, when all this first got rolling in the 1990s, the big issue was child labor. As I said, that was kind of the the poster child, uh, no pun intended, for the, the the bad acts of the industry was uh, child labor. I don't claim we have solved that problem, but the occurrence of child labor in the industry is, is far, far le lower, lower these days, if, if not entirely eradicated in certain parts. Other issues now predominate the discussion, forced labor, migrant labor, that kind of stuff. But the trend that I am most pleased by is a meta trend in a way, uh, and that is that 15, 20 years ago, compliance was essentially an afterthought when it came to sourcing decision making, right? You'd go and you'd inspect a factory and you'd look for price, quality, and delivery time. And if those were good, we want to work with this factory, let's just send the compliance folks in and see if there's any problems. That's how it worked, right? Today, it's the opposite. Today, compliance is not only part and parcel of the sourcing decision making, it's actually a threshold requirement. You don't get to look at that factory to see if the price, the quality, and the delivery matches your standards if they don't first pass the compliance people because you don't want to be in business with them at all if they're not socially responsible. That's the trend that I think is the most important one, uh, and, and we're very proud to be a part of that and to have helped bring it about. So I'll leave on that note. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Oh. My goodness, time flies when you're having well, fun. Well, we have one question from, from the, in the back who actually mentioned you before. Okay, okay great. One, one quick question in the back. Thanks. Hi, sorry about that mix-up in the date. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. I love that kind of mix-up. <laughs> um, Two-part question, real quick. What's the, what would you say the difference and, and what um, is your advantage between rap as opposed to fair trade, for example? And the second thing is, in this new generation and this new type of consumer, who are um, very socially savvy, and all they see is fair trade, fair trade, fair trade, fair trade. For instance, I have a store in San Diego that I can't sell to because you know it's like, well, if you don't have fair trade, blah, 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 blah. I said, well, I right. have RAP compliance. That's actually a lot more. Um, oh, it's much better. Much, much better, better, more robust, because I've been involved in auditing when I was designed for Disney, and it's like, it, it right. took a year of blood, sweat, and tears, so I know, but she didn't, she didn't right. want to hear that, like, what's rap, like, what, and what are you doing as far as marketing and stuff is concerned, because, yeah. you know, I know, you know, I've worked with you guys who are really good at what you do, and I've, I've seen firsthand what you've done, but it's not being recognized right now in the sustainability world. Thank you. I don't know this woman. I did not place her in the audience, <laughs> just so you all are clear about that. Um, the truth is, uh, ma'am, that we are actually not a consumer-facing label, and that's the single biggest difference between fair trade and, and rap. We position ourselves between the factory and the brand, the retailer, the buyer. We're not actually known, most of you I'm gathering did not know about rap, although many of you may have heard of fair trade. Um, and the reason for that is because, as I said, we are only speaking to the conditions at a particular facility, right? Between that facility and getting the product on, that, on the retailer's shelf, so much else goes on. That, that piece of clothing was on a boat for a while, in a distribution center for a while, then to a retail wholesale distributor. Who knows what happened to the workers along that chain back there? And then before it came out of that factory, so many other things may have happened to the raw materials. So we're only speaking to that one piece. And so we don't believe we can credibly say to the consumer that this jacket is the best on a social responsible fashion because I can tell you it's the best assembled jacket, but I really can't speak to what happened on the boat or in the store or on the farm or that or you know those New Zealand sheep that made it you know all get going in the first place. Fair trade on the other hand is consumer facing because they don't actually address facility specific situations. They're dealing more with the price and the conditions that the the seller got. 
that's what they're focused on. So when you say it's fair trade, you're saying that I made sure when I bought this, I did not, you know, um, what's the word here? Put, I did not undercut the, 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 the manufacturer. I paid a fair price for it. And then the assumption is that because they got paid well, then they're going to make sure their workers get treated well and all of that's going to flow from it. But no one's actually checking that. Fair trade isn't inspecting the factories. Fair trade is only looking at the transaction. Therefore, they're able to put the label on there, saying that the transaction that led to this thing coming to the shelf that you're buying it from can be validated as being a fair financial transaction. We're not in that business. Uh, we're, only, we're looking at the factory conditions. So we don't see ourselves as, as um, consumer facing the way fair trade does. Uh, in a very real sense, we're, we're a business to business label not a consumer-facing label. That's a great question. Thank you.